Hello, party people, and welcome to Oslo, Norway. I'm in front of the Munch Museum. Nothing to do with Doritos. It's a, a museum full of Edward Munch's artwork. The one that you probably know offhand is the screen. He's the guy who painted that. That whole museum is just full of his artwork, like 26,000 pieces of art uh, that he did over his life and donated, I believe, to the city. Uh, Oslo is a gorgeous city, all kinds of really pretty architecture, uh, modern and, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say ancient, but older. Uh, and I really wanted to shoot office hours in front of the incredibly beautiful Oslo Opera House, but I walked all around it this morning, couldn't find a good angle, so instead, here you get me waterside with the Munch Museum. So let's take your top voted question. Your top voted question comes from Brandon who asks, do you have any recommendations on building a resume for new DBAs? Typically when we say new DBAs, we mean someone who had another job before, which is usually either developer or sysadmin, and then transitioned into the DBA role. The biggest advice I can give you is, take all the crap out of your resume that you don't need to do anymore. I've seen people who, are, who used to be developers and they have like 10 lines in there about all the minutia, the small stuff that they used to do as, as uh, developers. Worked with the React framework to optimize page load speeds. And I'm like, if you're trying to be a database administrator anymore, you don't need to say any of that stuff. Just have like one line, two lines, and if you can, focus on the parts of your job that interacted with data. Your resume needs to focus on the place you want to go, not the place you're coming from. Sure, you might be proud of some of the things you've done over in your career, but it's time to let that stuff go and focus on the things that you want people to hire you to do. That best, biggest piece of advice I can give you there. Next up, oh wow, uh, Through the Barricades asks a tough one. Can you give us three example scenarios where we should use log shipping and three scenarios where we should use transactional replication? I try to keep my answers down to 60 seconds in here in office hours, so I'm not going to give you three. I'm going to give you one for each. Log shipping is great when you don't want to change the contents inside the database when you want that secondary server to have exactly the same data. And the best scenario for that, of course, is disaster recovery. When you fail over to your disaster recovery uh, server, you want the contents in the database to be exactly the same as they were in production. For replication, it's the opposite. Replication, it's when you want a server that doesn't have the same contents. Maybe it has more history for reporting purposes. Maybe it has different indexes optimized for reporting. So you get with that use of the R word there that the example I'm going to give you for transactional replication is when your main server needs to be lean and mean and only contain the current data, but you want your replication server to have all the history of all your sales through time and never have deletes on it, plus index the bejesus out of it. You can afford to do that on the secondary server, whereas you can't afford to index the bejesus out of the primary server because it needs to be lean and mean for those inserts, updates, and deletes. Next up, Ricardo asks, I came across an ID depart IT department the other day that was so wary of GDPR that development happened in production. Do you think this was just an aberration? Yeah, that, that's just an aberration. The problem with doing development and production that that means, by definition, you're giving your developers access to production data. Woohoo! That's not what you're supposed to be doing. As few people as possible in the organization should see customer data, things that are personally identifiable and so forth. You want to have very strict controls over that, and if everybody can see into there, that's a problem. Next up, we have Alberto asks, what is your opinion of TraceFlag 174, which increases the SQL Server engine's plan cache bucket count? We have high single-use plans, and we're on 2019 Enterprise Edition. 
Well, so let's think through this for a second. If you have a whole lot of single-use plans, that means you're not running them a second time. Why would you want to keep more of them? Why do you want to keep around more of something that you're not using today? I can guess, Alberto, what your clothes closet looks like. You're still hanging on to all those old underwear that are tattered and they got skid marks and they're barely hanging together. They got holes in them every which way. Alberto, if you bring someone home and they get a glimpse into your underwear drawer, or heaven forbid you're wearing that underwear when they go to take your pants off, you're going to be a single-use person. They're not going to come around again. Stop hoarding your old underwear and stop hoarding execution plans that you're never going to use again. How'd you like that? Next up, Ms. Elizabeth says, the SQL Assessment API versus DBA checks versus SP Blitz, which one wins in a cage match? <laughs> Um, so first off, one of them, the SQL Assessment API is run by Microsoft, and Microsoft is always very politically correct. Uh, they will not uh, give you opinionated information about the application that you have and design patterns. Uh, they will be very hesitant to tell you that a SQL Server feature is a bad idea or doesn't work. So I admire their willingness to ship something it's just never going to be as good as an opinionated uh, piece of software. DBHX, if I remember right, is PowerShell and involves the Pester uh, framework. So you're basically running unit tests against your SQL servers. Um, if you're very heavy into automation and you want regular alerting, then that would be a good solution for you. SP Blitz is more about people who need to go jump into a SQL Server for the first time, uh, have no control over the outer environment. All they're doing is focusing on SQL Server itself. Uh, and so that, that's really why each of those has different customers. The Microsoft product is aimed at Microsoft employees. Uh, pester checks, pester tests are aimed at people who uh, want monitoring and alerting. And SP Blitz is for people who need to rapidly take over SQL servers. Those are three different audiences. Next up, DB Stevie says, as you no longer provide production DBA training, who would you recommend for training in that space? I don't think anybody's doing it. I don't think anybody's doing it anymore. Because the thing is, for a while there, it was production DBA work was rapidly changing. It was rapidly changing because the cloud has all these nuances um, that are dramatically different between each cloud provider, between Amazon, Azure, and Google. Um, there were, the state of PowerShell was rapidly changing. The state of Azure SQL DB and managed instances was rapidly changing. So for a while there, it wasn't cost effective to build training when the contents were outdated within a year or two of shipping the class. As a, as a teacher, I have to be able to build training material and then resell that for a period of time, or else if I have to keep building it over and over again, I lose money on the material. So I think what you're seeing now is kind of a, a, a desert of training there because it wasn't profitable. I don't have anybody I can point you to, and I don't think that that thing is changing. Um, anytime soon. Now, the, the good news is, is if you're still doing conventional tasks like virtual machines on premises, uh, bare metal, I don't know that anybody's doing that as much anymore, or it, it's a relatively small portion of the audience, um, then you can use the same training that was always out there. Your job hasn't really changed much. Next up, Reluctant Director asks, a friend saw a covering index that had values in the included column that didn't match the table values. By dropping and recreating the index, it fixed the problem. 
Uh, a lot of reports use those index columns to improve performance. Any advice on how to mitigate this risk? Risk. Yes, run CheckDB. DBCC CheckDB checks for that exact scenario. Most folks that I know are doing index maintenance too often and CheckDB not enough. And I would suggest that you flip those. You probably want to run CheckDB daily if you can and hold off your index maintenance. Maybe do it once a week or less frequently than that. And we'll do one more. Ali the DBA says, have you ever worked with NetApp files, Azure NetApp files? On face value, it looks like it's infinitely better than managed disks. With the fact that it's an SMB, oh, he's got like three questions in here. Okay, so first off, have I ever worked with it hands-on? No, uh, I, I don't have a problem with it. I've just never had a client who said, okay, I'm gonna use SQL Server in Azure. I'm gonna do it in VMs. I need shared disks. I'm willing to use a third-party tool. Because it, it technically Azure NetApp files, it's a single party tool. Oh, there's a helicopter going overhead. It's coming from Microsoft, but Microsoft is running something that's built by NetApp. Um, so the, you're talking about, like if you think about a pie chart, I know pie charts aren't sexy, but the number of people who are in each of those levels, this, it just goes down further and further below. Um, there just aren't that many people who are a good fit for it, and I would, I would argue that you should probably be looking at other technologies. In the cloud, the KISS rule applies. Keep it simple, stupendously gorgeous, and, and you smell great too today. Uh, keep it as simple as possible. The more that you inject more dependencies, the more risks that you run, uh, of running into something that, after all, hardly anybody else is using this technology, uh, the, the, the less likely it is that your scenario is well-tested and bug-free. Now, he continued on with, uh, would the fact that it's an SMB file share put you off? The, one of the challenges that you run with running uh, your data on SMB file shares is if you map it via WAC WAC share, server name WAC share name WAC file name uh, is that you're competing for the same network bandwidth that your VM uses for everything else that it does perhaps backups pushing results out to clients and so forth cluster heartbeat communications and in the cloud, you, you don't really get the ability to add an unlimited amount of network cards with an unlimited amount of throughput. Yeah, you can add more interfaces, you can add more subnets, but it's really hard to do throttling between them. So I've seen situations, lots of situations, where people put their data and log files on network shares, SMB volumes, and then under heavy load, like backups, because what do backups do? They read a lot of data and then they write it out, usually to the network, uh, under heavy load, that their cluster lost heartbeat communications and ended up failing over or going unresponsive. In theory, can it work? Sure, especially with low load uh, SQL servers uh, and very high speed VMs that have large network pipes, like the 10 gig network pipes. Um, there you stand a pretty good chance of doing it, but why inject all those dependencies? I, I don't, I should say, I don't think you're bad for looking at it. I think in theory, it sounds really good. It's just that in practice, those are the problems you might run into. All right, well, there we go. There is another uh, episode of Office Hours. After this, uh, it's uh, Thursday morning. Tomorrow I teach an all-day workshop. So after this, I'm gonna go over to that Munch Museum. And uh, uh, then I teach all day tomorrow. I have a, uh, my dynamic SQL session on Saturday, at Data Saturday, uh, Oslo. Then after that, Sunday morning, I hop, a, hop the train over to Bergen, the Flam Railway, it's supposed to be one of the most beautiful uh, rail routes in the world. I think it's also one of the steepest uh, rail routes in the world as well. Um, that's most of Sunday. It's like a seven hour, or eight hour train ride, I think, altogether. And then uh, Monday afternoon, I set sail for a Hurtigruten cruise up the Norway coast, up the coast of Norway. Originally planned this trip back in sept or back for September of 2020, but of course we all know how that went. 
Uh, so I'm really excited about the ability to get up there and see the coast of Norway. I'm also really excited because yesterday I got an email from Herdegruten that they had lots of high-end cabins on the ship. I had booked an inside cabin, just basically a bed and a toilet and a shower, uh, because I figured I'd spend most of my time out on deck. Uh, but they had a bunch of high-end cabins available. So I got like the best cabin on the ship with these bay windows that stick out over the side of the ship and all this for like a thousand bucks extra. So I'm like, hey, all right, which is really good, especially given that it's just me on the cruise. It's just me uh, by myself. Um, so that is, uh, that'll be uh, one week. And then after that, I fly back home to Vegas, at home for Vegas for a while, not very long actually and uh, really excited to get back to the cars. I've got a couple of fun things cooking around the cars. So I will see you all at the next Office Hours. Adios.